Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our fourth session in our higher education series. I'm Rachel Paul with IAAP. Before we get started today, just a few housekeeping items to go over. Closed captioning is provided. You can select the closed captioning icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen. All attendee mics are muted to prevent any background noise or disruptions. As in our previous sessions, this session will be recorded and made available to you afterwards. We will be taking questions. I encourage you to leave your questions in the Q&A and we will get to those uh, during pauses or at the end. And the chat will be monitored just for general dialogue and any technical issues. So I'm happy to turn today's program over to James Thurston. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, I'm James. Uh, Vice President here at G3ICT, and I'm joined today by Keith Hayes, who is the ADA IT Coordinator in the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, Keith, do you want to just say a quick, quick hello? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Fantastic. So our goal with this session is to share some detail about the University of Illinois approach to being more accessible and a more inclusive university. Uh, and I've been really, uh, I keep looking forward to this discussion with you because I think a lot of people know that the University of Illinois um, has a long history of leadership and, and commitment to accessibility inclusion, dating back really to providing accommodations to soldiers after the Second World War. Um, the university does a lot of accessibility and inclusion things really well and is, uh, I think, really generous with, with its expertise and Keith, with your expertise to the greater uh, global accessibility community. So we appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to exploring some of that uh, with you this morning, this morning here, and I'm actually in Washington, DC. Um, so Keith and I want to surface and share some what, what we think are valuable and actionable experiences from his experience and from the U of I's experience that hopefully will apply to and inform um, some of your own higher education accessibility journey steps. Um, this, is, this session today is the fourth in the IWP's six-part higher education series. Um, it's also the second of the final three sessions that relate to or are sourced from uh, some work that G3ICT has been doing with higher education institutions using our smart university digital inclusion maturity model tool. Uh, before we jump in with Keith, let me just give you some, maybe some brief context about that tool, which kind of informs our discussion and, and the work that we've been doing with, with the university. Uh, and is really the, the basis for our G3ICT engagement with, with U of I. Uh, and by extension, I guess, for some of the lessons and actions um, that we'll, we'll discuss today. So the, the Smart University Digital Inclusion Maturity Model, it's an assessment and benchmarking tool to help a university better understand how its digital transformation, that is how it's using technology, how it's using data, is either supporting accessibility and inclusion of people with disabilities, uh, and that's in faculty, staff, and students, or creating additional barriers to that inclusion and support. The, uh, the assessment tool is made up of 28 different variables. We call them enablers and it, that really define what it means for a university to be uh, inclusive as it's using technology. These variables or enablers contribute to the university's building a set of capabilities that support greater inclusion and accessibility across the university community. Um, in our tool, the, our maturity model tool, we've defined 18 core capabilities uh, that uh, are listed here and they're organized into, into five groups or pillars. Um, so with the tool, we look at things like the role of leadership, uh, the existence or not existence of a digital inclusion strategy. How does that relate to the broader IT strategy of the university? We look at the accessibility of the university's engagement tools. It's uh, the accessibility of, of information that it puts out in, in content. Um, we look at whether or not the, the university's promoting a culture of diversity and what that looks like in terms of training uh, on disability and accessibility in, in hiring people with disabilities. Uh, we look um, at procurement. How does the, the university go about investing in its technology assets and deploying those? Uh, is accessibility a requirement in those procurements? And how does it ensure uh, that accessibility uh, is a part of its purchases? Um, and of course, we also dig into technology and data uh, the backbone and lifeblood of a smart university and, and, and really look at how the, um, uh, the university knows whether or not its technology assets, its technology deployments are accessible uh, and what does it do when they're not. Um, so uh, it's a pretty robust set of issues um, and we use this maturity model tool with, with Keith and with the University of Illinois um, 
last year, uh, I forget exactly what time of year it was, um, and Microsoft actually brought us into work with the University of Illinois as one of their customers. Um, and during the process of using this tool, these 28 variables or enablers and 18 capabilities, working with Keith, we reviewed more than 20 different documents. Um, uh, the university did an online self-assessment where staff uh, gave their opinions of where, where they fall on these variables. Uh, and we also ended up uh, pulling together an expert team uh, to interview and work with, talk to more than 40 different University of Illinois faculty and staff over a couple of days to really dig into these variables. The result was a, a set of scores for each of these 28 variables. And I think more importantly, uh, and kind of leading into our conversation today uh, was a roadmap, uh, which is a, a set of recommendations, high priority recommendations, um, and then really a, a set of recommendations for each of these 28 variables. That, so if you're at level two for uh, your procurement process to get to levels three, four, and five, uh, we suggest you take these very specific steps. Um, the University of Illinois um, did relatively strong, as do all uh, universities. We've used this tool with, with several universities. Um, uh, and U of I did relatively well on some of these enablers or variables and, and room for op opportunity for growth and, and improvement on, on others. Certainly in the leadership category, I think uh, the university did relatively well and in some of the areas for, for uh, real improvements, I think we're around the use of data and metrics, procurement um, and partnerships uh, uh, to support greater inclusion and accessibility. So that's sort of an, an overview uh, background of, of how G3ICT came to, to work with Keith in the University of Illinois. Um, Keith, let's jump in now and hear from you, which is why we're, we're all here really. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign? Uh, I know you are just telling me there's a, I guess, a, a right order and a wrong order to the, to the town names. Um, a little <laughs> bit about it in a, in a general sense of the technolo technology landscape there without getting into accessibility just yet. Sure. Well, as, as James has alluded, the most important thing is that we know the townies from the students by the way they refer to Urbana-Champaign. See, those of us who live in, in the town call it Champaign-Urbana, and the students coming call it Urbana-Champaign. So we know immediately they're students, and uh, we need to possibly offer them directions or you know, other, other things they might need. So uh, speaking of students, uh, last fall, we had more than 52,000 students enroll. Uh, 33,000 of those were undergraduates and almost 18,000 uh, were graduate students. Uh, and then we have about 1,000 professional uh, students, you know, postdoc, et cetera. Uh, to manage that, we have about uh, 15,000 faculty and staff. Uh, almost uh, 3,000 are faculty and uh, another 11 and a half are, are non-academic non staff. So it's, there are a lot of students, yeah, I can and, say that. And uh, um, as, as you were saying uh, before we even jumped on, it, it, is a, it is a city, a small It city. is a city, oh yes, oh yes, it's a city. And uh, we have 16 colleges and five or so non-academic support units. And uh, those will come into play later, so I'll just name them. We have the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning, which is responsible for instructional design, uh, for assisting with uh, classroom innovation, uh, such as some of the newer smart and blended classroom technologies. And then also uh, they manage our uh, learning management systems and help instructors create uh, online courses. So our open online uh, things we use, uh, and then also, uh, Blackboard, or we call it Compass, Canvas, Moodle. Uh, we also have technology services. Uh, technology services manages most of the large enterprise software on campus, but not all of it. And uh, that's an interest, be, create an interesting conundrum. Uh, we also have uh, facilities and services, which manages our uh, GIS data for accessible routes on campus, and they also help with accommodations for our accessible facilities for students. We have Disability Resources and Educational Services, or DRES. Uh, they manage student accommodations, and they operate out of Applied Health Sciences. And then we have the Office for Access and Equity, which manages uh, accommodations for staff and faculty, and that's in the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, that is where you'll find our ADA, 
uh, coordinator and myself, the ADA IT coordinator uh, in the ADA division of OAE, we call it. Uh, but it's also a dual role because we are also through the vice chancellor's office, uh, simply uh, responsible for all of campus. And, and, Go ahead, please. Um, I know there, when we had, we, we had first met, I know there were some relatively recent restructuring and changes in, in, a, in a positive sense, I think. Can you talk a little bit about from an organizational perspective, which is one of the things that, that, that we look at and work on with, uh, with universities, uh, some of the changes there, and, and including, I think, your, your current role? Uh, Certainly. Well, three years ago, uh, almost four now, there was no vice chancellor for diversity, equity, and inclusion. The office did not exist. Uh, and uh, they decided to reorganize and create three different positions. Uh, so we have an associate vice chancellor for compliance, who's under the DEI, uh, the vice chancellor for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, I, the other one, I can't remember right now. And then there's, uh, there's the uh, DEI himself. Uh, so two years ago, a year and a half now, our ADA coordinator position was created. Um, that's Allison Kushner. And she, as I said, manages the OAE as well as uh, collecting metrics and things for all of campus and coordinating campus accessibility efforts. My position was created in September of last year. And uh, that is the uh, ADA IT coordination. That's the component that I've been working towards for eight years now to get this position in place. And uh, it followed the creation of our accessibility policy uh, in 2018. Well, correction, ratification of that policy. The policy was created in 2016. Um, so so, uh, so really uh, some, some important things coming together all at once. And I know you've been active on these issues and at the university for, for uh, a long time. Um, I think one of the other interesting things about the University of Illinois in, in that, that others may relate to as well, that are, it's, it's um, both a very large campus, uh, you are, but you also as a university and, and may, maybe Keith, even you and your role, play key roles as part of a, a state university system as well. Can you just maybe describe that a little bit? Certainly. So we exist within the uh, Illinois uh, state system. So we have three campuses. There's a U, a U of I Springfield, there's U of I Chicago, and then there's Urbana. And uh, with those three campuses there, I have counterparts at each one. Uh, and we are, each school's a slightly different focus as far as what they do. Springfield is the smallest, uh, Urbana is the largest. And what I have ended up doing is helping with some coordination between all three campuses, uh, along with my counterparts. Uh, we're looking at creating uh, parity with our policies and approach to accessibility. Uh, especially digital accessibility. There has been that type of coordination with our physical access, uh, our disability services coordinators, since I've been on campus. It really picked up in 2014, I believe, uh, 2015. But it's been there for a while. Uh, there's regular meetings. Uh, so we're looking at uh, procurement across the system. We're looking at resource allocation. We're looking at... Um, the possibility of shared procurement for large software. Uh, we do have, there's uh, AITS or the Academic Instructional Technology Services that is at the system level. They manage the, and have created a lot of the identity management software, uh, Banner, and uh, just the typical types of things that are going to be used across all three campuses that they need coordination on. And so that system office has been interesting. Uh, that's where I started working with the system is working with AITS and their accessibility. Uh, and uh, it's been a neat transformation because when I started, they didn't create have it as a uh, requirement uh, for the things they created. And now it's it's required in every project. So are you seeing a real opportunity that I think in, in interacting with with some of the other campuses, uh, maybe already seeing some of the benefits of that, uh, mm -hmm. I hope, but, but even looking forward um, do, do you sense a, a sort of shared level of, of uh, commitment and, and, and wanting to, to take steps together with, with some of your colleagues at the other campuses? Oh, yes. Yes, it's uh, the, the more in sync we are, the, the stronger our response. 
uh, to accessibility. And, so. uh, absolutely, and uh, we certainly we know of uh, obviously other other universities that are part of a, a university system, other campuses, but even some universities that are are just coordinating with with other colleges and universities around them. They're not part of a, a system, uh, but coordinating on accessibility specifically and getting benefit from that. So it's great to to hear you you helping to drive that forward within the university system there. Um, Keith, before we go on to uh, the, the first sort of substantive question about your, your journey there at the, at the university, um, if we look at the, you talked about the, the university system, you've certainly talked about uh, the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I am from away, so I'll, I'll, I'll say it that way. Um, there are some, uh, when we looked at the organization uh, it, and had, uh, had conversations with you and your, your colleagues at the university, there are a couple, I think, really interesting committees that came up that maybe uh, you might just want to touch on. One was TARC and the other was uh, CCRA, I think. I I'm forgetting what the acronym stand for. But CCAA. CCAA, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll start with uh, CCAA. That's the Chancellor's Committee and on uh, Accessibility and Accommodation. So CCA was created as a way to coordinate uh, across campus some of our um, programmatic access. So we were looking at issues with physical access, helping uh, update our uh, ADA transition plan and ensuring that uh, we had good, good physical access there and that, that was up to date. We also just sponsored awareness raising workshops and uh, we met with individual faculty who had ideas or who had concerns. And uh, I think at one point we sponsored a project on adding wheelchair accessible controls to elevators. So there were several elevators that were old enough to not have accessible controls. And so I think we installed that around 10 different elevators on campus. It was a neat project. So that's kind of what CCAA does. Uh, they were on hiatus for a year, and they're being reconstituted uh, this coming year. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Then we have the uh, Technology Accessibility Review Committee, uh, or the TARC, we call it. Uh, the TARC was uh, created by the Digital Accessibility Policy on campus. Their role is education about the policy, assisting to raise awareness that it exists, and uh, to support uh, my efforts and uh, Allison's efforts, so the ADA coordinators. And then they're primarily to review uh, exception requests for compliance. So any software that comes to campus must be reviewed uh, for accessibility. Uh, with the policy states we need to meet WCAG uh, 2.0, uh, matching, matching uh, Section 508 and uh, Illinois IT Accessibility Act. And if there, it cannot, then they must submit an exception request for us to review it, approve the need for the exception and approve their alternative access plan. So as there, and, and I think we'll talk about some, some uh, other structures, some other committees uh, in, a, in a moment, uh, but what you have there at the university are some some actively engaged and some sounds like re-engaging committees that, that can mm -hmm. be supportive as you're trying to drive a shift in both culture and and uh, and adding more systems and processes that are support accessibility and inclusion from an IT perspective. That that's aptly put. Yes. Great. All right. So when we uh, let, let's dive in maybe to to some of exactly what you're doing there, which is pretty exciting, I think. Okay. Um, so when we first met and did our engagement with the University of Illinois. We were at that point pretty deep into the the, the pandemic. Um, maybe can you talk a little bit about how the pandemic has impacted how you specifically in, in your role, but also the university obviously look at and act on accessibility? Certainly. Uh, well, first it kicked over the anthill. It caused a lot of scurrying. Uh, most, when we knew we were going to be shut down, we suspended most projects and focused on the uh, preparing for the transfer to remote instruction. And uh, our faculty were very perplexed. Uh, CITL managed uh, assisting them, the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. Uh, but what it did, it immediately cast into relief some of the issues with our digital accessibility on campus. 
Uh, we knew we would have to find a virtual uh, classroom uh, technology uh, that would scale. Uh, we utilized Zoom for that. And uh, we uh, purchased a license to Otter AI. This is before Zoom integrated Otter uh, for its captioning, for automated captioning and uh, increased visibility of the need for captions for accommodation. Uh, but in general, people were more willing to ask the question, is this going to cause an accessibility issue? Uh, sometimes they were willing to ask that question after I reached out to them and said, hey, have you considered accessibility? But uh, realizing that they would not have the recourses that they did in the past because students weren't on campus, then uh, it made it more imperative for them to make things accessible. And the uh, technology services was handling a lot of that, AITS and then a CITL. They were fairly willing to begin with. Uh, it was just a matter of reprioritizing a little bit due to the, the immediate need. And Keith, the, the people, it, it's great that people, um, and encouraging that people were reaching out. Um, maybe in reaction to communications from you, but may, maybe proactively, um, without obviously giving names or roles necessarily. Can you talk a little bit about who was reaching out and about what? Was it primarily from the academic side of the university or administrative as well, uh, both? I'd say it was primarily administrative. Uh, we had the deputy CIO who manages technology services would reach out on issues. Uh, and then I was still embedded within technology services at the time, as was my colleague, Tim Offenstein, who has since retired. Uh, and uh, we were managing accessibility consulting across campus. So we had some people approach us about their websites, which we then uh, connected to other people. We had uh, the TARC and Allison Kushner, uh, the ADA coordinator, come and talk to us. CITL, they were talking to us about classroom technologies uh, for and issues with Blackboard and Compass to ensure that, or rather Compass and Moodle to ensure that worked well. Uh, faculty mostly approached disability services, so DRES, uh, to ask about accommodations and what they needed to do. Uh, but just in general, there was just a little more coordination than had been there in the past. Um, and you, you, you mentioned um, uh, in some of our conversations about some of the specific things that, that I think during the pandemic, as you were thinking about making accessibility a part of the blended remote learning approach and, and evangelizing that, supporting that across the campus, some of the, the I think, interesting steps that, that you may have taken, uh, you mentioned uh, there was a, a seminar series, the ADA at 30 seminar series, um, and maybe the work of the, the communications unit. Uh, any, um, can you talk a little bit about some of those, those specific ways that you were maybe uh, evangelizing interest in accessibility? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, you mentioned the ADA at 30 uh, series uh, that uh, the ADA coordinator created uh, inspired by the 30 year anniversary of the ADA. And uh, we started a monthly uh, brown bag a seminar, a virtual virtual seminar that people could attend, where they would uh, learn about the uh, accommodation process at the university, accessibility in general, uh, things needed for accessible documents, uh, etc. cetera, uh, until I was able to get captioning, uh, automatic captioning turned on uh, by default in profiles for Zoom hosts. Uh, we were talking about that process as well. So, but that was another thing is because of the pandemic we worked on on the Zoom, uh, getting automatic captioning turned on because by default you had to go into your profile and enable it prior to starting a meeting. So, so where would you, um, this many months into the pandemic and, and winding down a, a, an academic year and semester, um, where, how do you feel about where you are today uh, from a, the remote learning approach maybe uh, specifically. Um, and it, maybe a little bit of an assessment where you, where you think you are now and, and looking forward um, in, in this area specifically, uh, any, any steps that you're looking at taking? Sure, well, 
One of the things we're looking at doing is uh, finding a new uh, proctoring solution. Uh, one of the issues we had there, it, it made the news that we opted not to renew Proctorio. Um, we, contrary to what some of what was reported, that wasn't primarily because of accessibility, but that was a consideration. Uh, and the reality is that there, as near as we can tell, there aren't any proctoring solutions, remote practice solutions that are fully accessible. There, there are issues with, with most of them. Uh, if anyone knows of one that's fully accessible, please contact me. We are looking for one, uh, as I said. So that's one thing where we're just looking at increasing that support. Uh, we are looking at reviewing our accommodation procedures to streamline them for remote instruction and students who are not on campus. So they were geared entirely for uh, in-person assessment and uh, evaluation uh, paperwork that way. So that's not working as well as we would like. I think our accommodation process has uh, slowed down to roughly maybe two thirds the speed to half of speed it was before. Uh, and we are just continuing conversation with more instruction with faculty for how they make sure that their presentations are accessible. Because it's not just a matter of having an accessible tool, you have to know how to use it in a way that, uh, for example, if I'm lecturing and sharing a PowerPoint, if I don't self auto describe or describe what I'm showing on screen, then someone who is blind won't know. And that was the same in classroom as well, but it's, um, it's a little more poignant now that we, we have the remote environment. There's just a lot of little things. I'm not sure what exactly to pick on, James. I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. No, that's okay. Uh, uh, and and how, uh, how uh, with faculty in particular, for example, how, how has that been received? The, fo the, the increased focus or, or maybe sense of urgency even about accessibility? I would say that we're, we still have an awareness issue where we're, we're trying to get penetration, do people understanding that you must be responsible for your own accessibility. Uh, we will help you, but ultimately it's everyone's, everyone's job. That being said, I would say most faculty want to make things accessible. Uh, if I approach them with a problem, uh, they say, oh, I didn't know that. How do I fix it? Uh, which is very encouraging. And uh, as I've been working with them, there's more faculty reaching out and saying, hey, I want to know how to do this. How do I fix it? Uh, so I'd say that's been generally positive. There are a few faculty members who don't like the interference. But I would say we're going to find that everywhere. Uh, it's, I think it's the perceived uh, barriers to adoption the perceived interference with modes of instruction and uh, a, a lack of awareness that we're not trying to tell people how to do their jobs. We're trying to show them how they can do it more inclusively and uh, invite them to partner with innovation and uh, in how to do this in a more streamlined manner. So, so raising awareness about it's everybody's responsibility, but also I, um, I'm guessing making sure that they know about some of the great resources like CITL and others that are available mm -hmm. to them. Yes, yes, exactly. And I know, uh, or I recall from from our conversations when we were doing the uh, the assessment and engagement, um, that there were uh, real pockets of strength, I guess I would say, mm -hmm. um, across the university. I, I one in particular being the College of Business, and it, it's all sort of born accessible approach. Um, uh, do you, if you're able, maybe just talk a little bit about that, just because I know that there are some real good practices there, and uh, the extent to which that can be a that that school can be a or department can be a sort of a beacon and uh, an example for other parts of the university. Sure. Uh, yeah. So they adopted the stance of born accessible, uh, partially because they were having some issues with the accommodation process. There were faculty there that did not want to accommodate. They felt like the need to accommodate was incongruent with the school of business. Uh, so this, of course, wasn't true. And uh, so they looked at it, worked on it, and came up with the slogan, Born Accessible, and worked hard to put tools in place uh, to make it easy. So they are reviewing all courses for accessibility anytime one is created. They are have some fairly strict requirements 
uh, for what you must do to make courses accessible. And they have some neat technologies going on. Uh, they're using a, a new technology called Class Transcribe that was created by a uh, professor in our computer science department. Uh, Lawrence Ongrave is his name. It's a fantastic program that allows you to crowdsource captions. And so they have set up, because uh, they the College of Business records every, every class. And so those things must be captioned. So they set up a way for students to rotate through and um, assign themselves to 10 minutes of a given portion of a video. And uh, they have a, someone to review quality once it's done. Uh, but that way it's very quick uh, to get captioning is done. And, and uh, but they've expanded this now so that it's beginning to work with our Kaltura media server. Uh, so we can, we can pull data out and uh, all our videos are hosted within Kaltura. And so that allows for searchability and automatic transcripts uh, and uh, as well as a route to create EPUBs directly from the transcripted materials. And it'll pull, you can pull screenshots out of the video or, or images that someone supplies and to so get an accessible EPUB at the end of it. Uh, so all of that allows their materials, which are supplied in just multiple formats in general to be accessible to everyone. That's not saying there aren't issues. There are, there's always going to be, but they're doing fantastic work over there. Yeah, it, it definitely sounded like it. And just a couple of things there, then we'll move on to the next topic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's interesting that in the work that we do with universities with these kinds of assessments and engagements, uh, it's not unusual for the College of Business to be kind of at the forefront of, of, mm -hmm. of leading the charge on accessibility inclusion from, from at least from my experience, uh, I think maybe for a variety of reasons. I think, and, and we'll we'll get to sort of the why of accessibility in the business case there at the university. But my sense is that at the University of Illinois, the College of Business had started to make that move from just legal compliance and, and risk avoidance to uh, you know, there are actually uh, real there there is a business case. Uh, there is a value proposition from being more accessible in terms of its faculty, staff, and students, um, which I think we see with other colleges of business, which are often doing a lot of work online anyway, um, and, and well-resourced in, in many cases. So not unusual to see the College of Business sort of at the forefront. The other thing that I, I just want to mention, uh, you mentioned uh, Professor, was it uh, on Lawrence? Um, Lawrence Ongrave, yes. Ongrave, yeah. Uh, one of the, the great things that the University of Illinois does that's a, a part of the assessment tool that we have is how is the university innovating around accessibility and inclusion uh, and using technology and data to solve kind of longstanding um, accessibility and inclusion challenges on the campus. And, and, and uh, that crowdsourcing solution, I think is a, is a really great example of that uh, in, in a real strength of, of the University of Illinois. So congratulations. Um, Thank you. Um, shifting gears a little bit. So uh, you've, you've been working, the university has been working to help make accessibility improvements across the university's technology assets, but at the same time also drive some, some organizational and culture change in support of greater accessibility. Uh, and maybe that's even, uh, harder than making sure that you're remediating accessibility issues in, in your technology deployments. But can, can you talk a little bit about how the maturity model process and the resulting roadmap may have played a role in helping to move things forward in terms of, of, uh, of that of organizational and, and culture change? Certainly. Well, one, uh, the uh, self-assessment process that we did uh, was very illuminating. Uh, it's it was fascinating that we consistently rated ourselves higher than what was found with the assessment tool. So basically uh, people felt like we were doing a much better job than we were, uh, partially because of the historic uh, nature of DREZ, since accessibility, physical access started there uh, with Tim Nugent you know, all those years ago. Uh, and so we thought we were doing great. We have everything sorted. And uh, they got the results back and discovered that no, that we have more work to do. And that was, that was interesting. Uh, I, I framed it in terms of we've demonstrated a commitment to accessibility, but we are still beginning to understand the impact, impact and uh, full extent of the changes needed to be fully inclusive on campus, especially when it comes to our technology. And uh, I was able to repeat that discussion around uh, with the IT Accessibility Liaison Program 
Uh, we have embedded liaisons in every academic unit now. Uh, and for the, uh, the DEI's office, the vice chancellor uh, for diversity and equity, uh, and moving up to the chancellor with the provost and uh, pointed out that we have some structural issues that we need to address in a new way because the historic way we've done things on campus, the traditional way, don't work now. And it's not through lack of wanting, it's through just lack of understanding. And so that was where uh, going through the, uh, the assessment, the roadmap that you gave us, uh, the initial steps that were outlined were fantastically helpful. And they matched very closely with what I had been, been saying that we needed to do. Uh, so I was very happy about that. Uh, and I had that in front of me just to reference and I've lost it now. So it, it's, it's great to hear that. And I, I, I should explain maybe that, that when we do these assessments, we, we put together a, a team of, of experts from different perspectives, from the, the disability community, from technologists that have worked on accessibility in universities and, 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 uh, uh, and really try to bring to the university the best possible set of experiences to, to, to help them think about their journey and, and give them real time uh, uh, advice and counsel as well. Um, and it's not unusual for, for um, whether it's a city or a university to, uh, in a self-assessment to, to assess themselves higher than maybe the, the, the end result would come from the expert team. Uh, um, and the other, one other thing that you mentioned there that I just wanna point out as well that we saw as a real strength uh, of, at the University of Illinois to build on is that liaisons program. I, I'm not sure how long it, it had been around, uh, but uh, the fact that you have placed people with accessibility at least on their mind part of the day um, it was, was a, a, an accomplishment, I think, and B, uh, we felt something really useful to, to continue building growth and, and greater improvement on accessibility. Yeah, no, we of course did create that, uh, come up with the idea of that program. That something is being used to great effect at multiple universities. Right. Uh, I believe it was pioneered at Penn State, but I'm not certain. Uh, um, so Keith, the, you mentioned that the, the, the roadmap, the maturity model process has maybe reinforced some dialogues that you've been having around greater mm -hmm. coordination, collaboration and investment. Um, uh, where maybe the, which I, I think is an issue at, at any university and really in any large organization, this issue of coordination, collaboration, and investment in, in being very cost-driven with no real focus on, or not enough focus on accessibility. Um, uh, as we were preparing and you were giving a bit of an update on, on how things were going at the University of Illinois, you, you, you mentioned what I think is a, a great example of progress since we were working with you, um, which is you um, being added to the IT Governance Council. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, IT Council is a government structure created uh, under the office of the CIO. And it is IT professionals and deans and others across campus in key decision-making roles. Uh, our security officer is one member, uh, our identity management officers, et cetera. And it's to consider the strategic uh, decisions in the uh, IT procurement or IT deployment across campus rather. Uh, so it's not directly tied to procurement. And so uh, being there at the table means that I can ensure that accessibility is given voice uh, so that we're not just thinking in terms of business requirements uh, outside of accessibility, uh, that accessibility is starting to be thought of as a business requirement and the way it should be. Uh, and uh, so that's it's just been a little so far. I'm, I'm supposed to be giving a presentation more about my role and the needs on campus uh, sometime here in the next month uh, at Erickson. We meet monthly, uh, sometimes bi-monthly. Yeah, it's I, I think a fantastic success and, and step forward that that at the university. And I'm not sure what uh, how it came to be that you were you were placed there, but the fact that accessibility has a, literally a seat at the table. Um, and in that accessibility is now being looked at from a, an IT strategy and priority perspective in a way similar to security and other key issues, mm -hmm. uh, seems like an enormous opportunity in advancement, I, I think. Yeah, the way, the way that happened was building trust with technology services over several years of not being alarmist about accessibility, but explaining the risks uh, that we were in. And that's difficult to do when all it takes is one lawsuit. So, 
we need to, to find a way to say, we have a problem. I don't want to scare you, but we should fix it. And that takes a while to build that trust. Uh, but then pointing out after the policy and my shift in roles that here are several strategic procurements and deployments that we did where accessibility is not included. And now we're having some issues that might have gone better if we'd had accessibility at the table. And they said, oh, right. And the CIO said, I'll add you. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure, yeah, they, they uh, from an IT perspective, saw that, the sense of that immediately. Um, yes. Sort of in, in parallel to, to the, the changes that have been happening around uh, elevating accessibility in the IT infrastructure of the university. Um, I, I, you've also talked a little bit about how maybe with the, the diversity and inclusion infrastructure that that leadership there is now really seeing accessibility as an integral part of diversity and inclusion as well? They're starting to. Uh, they're still having trouble coming to terms with it as an active part of diversity and equity. And I think that's because institutionally we've thought of it in terms of accommodation. And so in a reactive mode. And so there's been more explaining uh, that this is a culture shift that is needed. It's a central aspect of DEI, right along with dealing with racism, right along with dealing with uh, gender equality and sexual harassment. Uh, and um, so it's just, it makes sense to consider it in those terms. And the only really functional way to approach it is with culture change, because as long as we're in a, a compliance only mode or in a reactive mode, we're not going to get there. Sure. So the, that, after I was able to explain that at length to the, uh, the vice chancellor for diversity and equity, uh, that was a new consideration to him. It came along with the uh, roadmap uh, document, the executive summary to that. Uh, and uh, we were able to also explain that to the um, uh, vice provost, associate provost uh, as well, and explained that we need to be thinking about this uh, in this way. And it's made a difference there. They're not yet willing to commit resources beyond traditional channels, but I think we're going to get there. Yeah, well, it, it, it's, a, it's a journey and congratulations on, on even in these, this relatively short amount of time since, uh, since our, we last worked together, uh, these shifts, these, these changes, these organizational changes that are, should position you to make uh, even more progress moving forward, which is great. Um, Shifting gears a little bit, uh, so you've, you've related to, I think, some of these important changes that have been happening there that, that you've been helping to drive and, and have been describing. How, uh, how, is the, how does the, the University of Illinois, and, and if you're able, maybe even the system, but, but certainly the University of Illinois, think about the business case for accessibility, the, the, the why of accessibility? Sure. Excuse me. So... I would say we're still coming to terms with just what a business case for accessibility would look like. Uh, we have begun to understand that the risk that comes with inaccessibility and an Office of Civil Rights complaint and finding could mean that our strategic, uh, well, one, loss of student revenue because students will choose to go elsewhere. Uh, but with OCR complaints and findings, we could end up having an audit of our, uh, I think you used the term ICT, Instructional Computing Technology. Yeah, I use, uh, we use EIT, which is uh, Electronic Information Technology, uh, but they mean the same thing. Um, <laughs> oh, Information Computer Technology, rather. Anyway, um, that our strategic uh, plans for those technology deployments and our reliance on software that we're using uh, in a large capacity could be shaken with very, very tight deadlines. And uh, that's going to be very expensive for us. Uh, that was something that uh, the um, uh, provost office understood when it came to looking at uh, Proctorio was they were looking at a renewal, license renewal. And they came to understand, oh, well, we could have a problem though with this other issue along with this. So we should probably uh, Go with something else. Uh, so that was good. But really, it comes down to um, still they're concerned about accessibility getting in the way of day to day business. 
Uh, you know, for example, when we make it this in a few minutes, we have roughly 20,000 uh, technology procurements every year. The majority of those, I'd say probably, what do they tell me, 70 to 80% are um, purchased under the unit discretionary uh, budgets. Uh, so there's something called a P card and TEM. Uh, anything below $15,000 is not monitored beyond that. It's merely recorded as a line item. And uh, the difficulty is that how do we get in front of that and make sure accessibility is a requirement there at that scale? Uh, yeah, and we will uh, we'll, we'll definitely dig in deeper a little bit more on, on, on procurement uh, mm -hmm. uh, because the university is a, an enormous consumer of technology and purchaser of technology. On this 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 issue of the um, the business case, the mm -hmm. why the value proposition for accessibility and really in, inclusion, you had mentioned when when we were getting ready for the this discussion, um, the the intricacies of of supporting this shift from from a departmental or or unit level mm -hmm. consideration of risk and resourcing to to maybe a more coordinated uh, system wide perspective on on that. Can you talk a little bit about what the that looks like at the university? Sure. So uh, as with most universities, uh, budgeting and resourcing has been considered per unit. And uh, that has worked great in the past for uh, business operations. However, now that we are moving to a more digital environment where software is purchased and other uh, technologies are purchased and used multi-unit, uh, plus the need for captioning, et cetera. Uh, having individual budgets isn't working as well because there's not the resources there to pay for captioning. There's not the resources there to fix a website that was outsourced. There's not the uh, understanding necessarily to make sure that a given technology that a unit purchases that begins to take root across campus is accessible. And so we are... Uh, coming to the understanding, and that we're not there yet, that we're going to need to put some central resourcing behind this uh, and uh, some personnel behind it as well as budget. So that, for example, if there's a unit that has a website that has accessibility issues, we need someone who can be an evaluator and a remediator to float and go to that unit if they don't have someone, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the questions was with uh, campus procurement in general, uh, that issue I talked about with the uncoordinated purchases. One of the things we've allowed in the past was for uh, what they call small purchases, uh, which is anything under $50,000. Uh, a unit would be able to handle all the contracting themselves and a vendor could come back and say, we wanna waive the accessibility requirement. Uh, that's just too difficult for us to meet. If you want our contract, we want to waive that. And so the business office would get notified and they would ask the purchasers, do you accept that risk? And they would say, well, yes, we accept that risk. We need the software. That has since changed. And is in, where, how it's going to, to look like is, is in consideration. But when they when procurement came to understand that a unit accepting a risk could affect the entire rest of the university and possibly the system as a whole uh, because of the way OCR works, they realized very quickly that that's something that we can't allow. Uh, so we're working out just what process of review and approval we'll have. Currently, uh, the contracts will be directed to me. Uh, after we've gone back to the vendor and said, I'm sorry, no, we must meet these things to do business. and. By the way, if you meet this for us, you're going to meet that for everyone across the US because that's federal law. Uh, so a little bit of education with vendors as well. Uh, so that's, that's been the primary thing so far is, is helping understand that uh, need for uh, coordinating risk across all of campus. Uh, and I'm also been phrasing it as if we can get past this stage, this remedial stage of what we're doing, then we can get into the business of innovating. We can get into the business of uh, earning grants and being awarded grants for the things we're doing. We can be showing our fantastic uh, classroom approaches that are inclusive, where accommodation 
is needed far less because we've done this ahead of time. Uh, so anyway, I could keep going. Sure, no, no, this is re really good. So in, in this this discussion, and I realize it, it's in process, this kind of mm -hmm. uh, making these changes to procurement that, that you and uh, I guess some of your colleagues have recognized as being beneficial, both to the faculty, staff, and students, but also to your ability to innovate and, and drive some other changes, uh, making sure that accessibility is a part of procurement. Mm -hmm. Who can you describe it in some at some level, kind of who's a part of those conversations? Who are you working with to drive that change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's on multiple levels. Uh, on the Urbana campus, it is the um, vice chancellor for compliance or associate chancellor for compliance, uh, the ADA coordinator, AEIT coordinator. Uh, the head of uh, campus purchasing, the, pur the purchasing office, the CIO, uh, and um, I will be beginning those discussions with IT Council. So that's on campus. Uh, and then we're also at the system level working on an, a policy guide that will help coordinate across campus. And one of the recommendations is that in that guide, is to ensure that there are, <clears throat> pardon me, strict uh, procurement requirements uh, and uh, evaluation requirements, et cetera. And it's, it's been somewhat modeled off of what Urbana has done, but there's been fantastic input from uh, UIC and UIS as well. Uh, the, the biggest question right now is uh, how do we scale and how do we put resources in place? Uh, there's, yeah. On, on procurement within the system, which is interesting, uh, mm -hmm. do you see any uh, on procurement, uh, any of the other campuses, um, are, are their approaches similar to yours or are any other sort of best in class when it comes to procurement? There, um, I know that UIC has been putting in some uh, great requirements. Uh, we, uh, Aside from other work, I guess also uh, I work with the Big Ten Academic Alliance, the CIO IT Accessibility Group, and we created in conjunction with the uh, system purchasers across multiple institutions, some um, RFP requirements uh, for accessibility that were much stronger. Uh, those are going into a place on the Urbana campus, and I'm not sure if they're in place at uh, UIEC. Uh, I know, so my um, colleague is on the call, so she, so uh, she might chime in and and you know post sure. and say yes or no, but in general, it's everyone is looking to to coordinate and make it much stronger. Um, I, I know, I mean, regardless of organization, whether it's a university or a, a city or other governmental entity, um, this this issue of procurement and making sure that the technology we're buying and deploying is accessible is is pretty critical. I think one of the, and G3ICD does a lot of work on this issue of procurement. One of the, the best organizations that I've seen on procurement, uh, regardless of whether it's a, a, a national government agency somewhere in the world or a, a city, um, is, has actually been a university, Georgia Tech. Mm. Uh, we've done some, some work with them and uh, they've worked hard to put in place systems that, that they are, and, and they're actually tracking with data that they, they know that somewhere in the neighborhood of just north of, or just above 80% of their procurements, including micro procurements, are being captured in a system to, that makes sure that they are including access, the appropriate accessibility requirements in their tenders and their RPs, that they're getting VPATs from vendors. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also making sure that, which I think is great, their procurement department for the university, uh, it does training for different departments across campus, not just on procurement, but accessibility is always a part of that and, and accessibility is part of the tender. So they're really pushing to get those, that, that measured number, that 80%, that number up, that that's how they can get it. That's great to hear, James, uh, because that is, that has been part of the discussion is um, procurement wants to be able to add accessibility training into their, into their training. Uh, I am working with an IT council group to put in place a, uh, database for technology uh, procurements. And we'll be working on uh, finding ways to include entering into the database procurements. So great. that's that's great to hear that worked well. Great. Uh, um, so we're, we're, we're getting towards mm -hmm. the end here, just maybe as a, 
any last thoughts, Keith, on uh, we, we all know that that making these kinds of change, system changes, cultural changes uh, around accessibility improvements can take time. Uh, and I know from my discussions with you uh, at the time and since then that you really see the importance of being proactive and, and making mm -hmm. strong changes in, in the moment, at the moment, uh, uh, that sort of anthill analogy, I guess. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, about some of that and maybe how uh, um, the maturity model has helped with that, hopefully, but, but certainly how areas where, where you've sort of really taken the initiative to be proactive to make these changes. You, you had mentioned uh, the, um, so, some examples around procurement and, and maybe some of the, the technology deployments. Sure. Um, so let me, let me think. I have a couple of thoughts that are kind of conflicting with each other at the moment. So one of the things that the uh, roadmap assisted with was helping us understand the need to make a stronger strategic case. Uh, now, that was something that I, I knew, but that wasn't something that was known in general across campus. Uh, and it also was helping, it helped leadership know that they are doing good work here and that they're in support, but that there are some specific things that they can do. And so that's opened the door to have more conversation about being proactive in general. And uh, one of the things that uh, goes with culture change and goes with proactivity is the need for education and awareness. No amount of technological solution will do this. No amount of policy will do this. Uh, there must be, unless the policy is saying, go educate, which ours is. And so it's been adopting a mode of reaching out to units when there is an issue and saying, hey, we have an issue here, were you aware? And how can we work with you to put, a, put something in place so that this doesn't really happen again for you? Uh, because it's, it's difficult and expensive when we have to deal with it after the fact. And that's been good. Uh, as I mentioned before, that's worked well with procurement. Uh, it's working well with uh, technology services and the CIO. Um, and yeah, it. So, uh, I, I think that's actually a, a, a great spot to, 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 to begin to end our conversation. Mm -hmm. the, the, this, the steps that you've taken to be proactive, the, the way that you've, you've helped to sort of force and, and, and push accessibility and, and disability inclusion uh, into the leadership structures of the university have been fantastic. Um, uh, e even making sure that in some of the, the, the recent uh, technology purchases and deployments, accessibility is a, a larger part of that. So I, I think that's great. And, and thank you for, for your willingness to, to be so open and clear about the journey that the University of Illinois has been on uh, and that you've been helping to lead and, and drive. Um, I appreciate it uh, and, and applaud you for, for your great work. Thank you. Sure. And, yeah. and that, do you want to make any, any last remarks? Yeah, actually. Uh, one thing I'd like to say is that it's very easy to become discouraged. Uh, if there are, you know, small barriers can make large ripples uh, in this arena. And it's easy to get into a feeling of embattlement where you're fighting with and trying to convince people to be accessible. And what I would say that I found is that most people want to make things accessible once they understand that there's a need for it. And so if you approach people in a mode of collaboration and in a mode of empowerment where you are saying to them, hey, we need to do this. Here's what you need to know. And it's not that hard. You don't know what you don't know, and that's fine. But let's work with me here because we're still trying to find better ways to do it. And I'd like to know what that works like for you. And so it's a matter of being positive, basically. There's a time and a place for, you know, and there are individuals who will not want to do this. But the validity of it is in question by most. It's just a matter of how. Fantastic advice from from in the trenches at a university, which we appreciate. Well, let's let's wrap here. And as uh, uh, just as an announcement, the the final webinar in this series 
The sixth one will will be next week, uh, and that one will will include a, a discussion with uh, Megan Lawrence from Microsoft and Damien Sion, a, a, a higher ed and accessibility expert. Um, those are two people that have been involved in working with G3ICT and, and working with and assessing several universities. And in that webinar, the final installment of the series, we'll actually be talking through the quick wins. These are the, the things that we put into this roadmap when we're working with the university. There are the things that steps a university can take relatively easy, easily, rel relatively quickly to make pretty immediate impact on, on greater accessibility and inclusion. And, and we'll spend some time talking through what, what are some of those quick wins that universities can be doing. So Keith, thank you so much. It's, it's always wonderful chatting with you and working with you. Well, thank you, James. I've appreciated it. And thanks everyone for uh, tuning in today. Thank you, Keith. It was excellent. It's Christopher. Thank you, Christopher. I appreciate that. Fantastic. Are there any questions? We are the quiet group today. Um, we had a couple of things in the chat, but no, yeah, we just a few comments, but no, no questions. <laughs> it's a quiet group. Usually we get a couple, but. Well, this time. I, maybe they're all asleep. I'll tell you, it's a lot of webinars going on. We, yeah, um, Keith, we're doing um, M enabling um, is having in June um, a higher education um, briefing, and we'll be circling back around to you. One of the things that we've been thinking about doing um, is maybe kind of having a, a kind of like a, a Brady Bunch approach. You know, we have all these different experts in the windows that says you know the top things that have happened this year that were positive, and just you know have like some sort of real quick like lightning. Um, aspect of it. I think it'd be kind of fun to have you on that piece. That sounds kind of neat. Sure. Yeah. And I, I know you haven't worked with them uh, yet, but I would recommend uh, Nate Evans from Michigan State and uh, Scott Marshall from University of Minnesota. Great. Keep going. Excellent. <laughs> hey, and Keith, um, well, I, I can give you some too, Christopher. We have, you and I have a, lots to talk about. Um, on the on the College of Business comment that I made, mm -hmm. uh, um, Keith, we're actually our next engagement like this with the the maturity model is actually with the College of Business at George Washington, Uni specifically with the College of Business at George Washington University, which should be interesting. Neat. Yeah. Well, if you want the name of one of the primary drivers at College of Business at uh, UIUC, that would be John Tubbs. Okay. Let me write that down and then I'm gonna I'm gonna run and make sure my kitchen is no longer covered in water. In a minute. Thank you, James. Thank hey, you, it saves Keith. mopping time. Bye everyone. Sure. Bye, thank you. Thank Kat. you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much, Rachel. Thanks, Chris. Really, Keith, thank you so much. It's, it's you're you're fantastic. I really thank you. appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Take care. All right, bye-bye.